you for those who are just now joining us online. And uh, we're going to sing now uh, page number two, if you have a book. The second page is one of our favorites, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And we'll stand if you're able, and once again to sing, Come Thou Fount. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never cease. Oh, for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song that sung by flame. Sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained. Like a feather, find my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Amen. We are prone to wander. This song says that uh, uh, I know thy hand will bring me safely home. He, he sought me when I was wandering from the fold of God, it says, and rescued me with his precious blood. But then it says, uh, Lord, bind my wandering heart. Let thy goodness bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We're all prone to wander. Now, you might come tonight uh, in our study of the, the next book of the Bible, in this study of the ultimate Route 66, going through the 66 books of the Bible. You might come to the book of Numbers and say, those Israelites, how could they wander around for 40 years? But we're all prone to wander, aren't we? And so the Lord, he can... Uh, uh, take our heart and seal it for him. He can find us when we're wandering from his fold and bring us back to him. So let's look tonight at this fourth book of the Bible, the book which we call Numbers. And let's open our Bibles to Numbers. Would you, if you have a copy of God's Word, open it with me to Numbers chapter 1. We've been reading the first chapter of each book on Wednesday nights just to give you a little bit of a feel for the books. But I'm not going to do that tonight because it's mostly names tonight in the first chapter. Uh, but we will read the first four verses. Let's read the first four verses together. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number, there's the word number, 
that we get the book name from, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. Thou and Aaron shall number them by their names, uh, by their armies. And with you there shall be a man of every tribe, every one head of the house of his fathers. And then he goes on to name who will be the head of each of the families. So, uh, we'll stop for there for now, but keep your finger in the book of Numbers. We'll look at it a number of times. We have a few verses on the screen, but a number of the books of verses and numbers are not going to be on the screen. You have to look them up in the book of Numbers for yourself. But as we continue on this journey of the ultimate Route 66, we come now to this uh, uh, time after Mount Sinai and the new nation of Israel is given the chance, the opportunity to believe God and to go into the promised land. But instead, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years one year for every day that the spies were in the land in unbelief. And this is the story of their wanderings. Um, and, you know, it only took about 40 days to, or, sorry, about 40 hours to get Israel out of Egypt. But it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel and to get it out of their hearts and uh, to get them to believe God and worship him. And uh, he used this time of 40 years to discipline them, to help, in order to help them to grow and to prepare a new generation that would believe him and would go in. And uh, it's a book of numbers of people, but each number represents a person that God cares for, and he cares for them just as he cares for us. Now, I, I know that uh, we've been um, saying that we can try to memorize the books of the Bible together. And so let's try to uh, give you this list of 66 books once again. And uh, remember that we've broken it down into, uh, this is the Old Testament anyway, 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. Five books of Moses, five books of his, history, five books of poetry, five major prophets, and 12 minor prophets. So we're just working on the first five together. Would you say them with me? The first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So we're in the, uh, we're in the second 2,000 years of human history. The first 2,000 years was human history with the four main events, creation, corruption, uh, then the catastrophe of the worldwide flood, and then the confusion of the Tower of Babel and the nations getting started from, from that. But then, then we start the 2,000 years that the Bible tells of Hebrew history, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. And they started with a family, a family of four, not four major events, but four people in the book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the story of Joseph. And then because Joseph got sold as a slave into Egypt, and then he became the second in command. He invited the rest of the family to come and join him in Egypt. And there were 70 of them. But then they went from a family of 70 to a nation of about 2 million. So here in this passage, we're going to see that there's a uh, uh, the, the number of them. But it's just going to tell you the number of the men who can fight. But you have to imagine there's also women and children. So it's going to be got to be about two to three million people. And God had brought them out of Egypt in an amazing way. And about, like I said, it took them about 40 hours to get out of Egypt after Pharaoh said, I will never let them go. And then the, the, the death angel passed through. And uh, he saved anyone who, who put their faith and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost or the lintel of the door. He passed over. And that's where the Jewish people get the phrase, the Passover, because he passed over them. But now they have, uh, this is now, it says, the second uh, month of the second year after they've left Egypt. So they've come now to Mount Sinai, got the Ten Commandments, got the whole book of Leviticus. <laughs> and now they're starting to go on the move again. 
And uh, that's where we're going to pick up here in the book of Numbers. But I know that some people are more visual uh, audio learners than others. And so we're going to uh, try something new tonight and show you a, just a, a four-minute summary of the book of Numbers in a video form. And that will give you an overview that maybe hangs some facts that I give you on these pegs of, of, for, that you find from the video. So uh, we'll go ahead and start that, Brother Sylvia, see if it works right now. The Book of Numbers. This fourth book of the Bible carries forward the story of Israel after their exodus from slavery in Egypt. God had brought them to Mount Sinai, and he entered into a covenant with them there. And despite Israel's rebellion, God had graciously provided a way for Israel to live near his holy presence in the tabernacle. So the book of Numbers begins as Israel wraps up their one-year stay at Mount Sinai, and they head out into the wilderness on their way to the land that God promised to Abraham. Now the book's storyline is designed according to the stages of their journey. So the first section begins at Mount Sinai, but then they set out and travel to the wilderness of Paran. And then from there, they travel to the plains of Moab, which is right across from the Promised Land. Now the first part opens with a census where the people are numbered, that's where the book gets its name, and then there are laws about how the tribes of Israel were to be arranged in their camp. So the tabernacle was to be at the center, and then around that, the priests and the Levites, and then around them, the 12 tribes neatly arranged with Judah at their head. Now, this was all an elaborate symbol about how God's holy presence was at the center of their existence as a people. This is all followed by a whole series of laws that develop the purity laws from the book of Leviticus. If God's presence was going to be in their midst, every effort should be made to make the camp pure, a place that welcomes God's holiness. In chapter 10, the cloud of God's presence lifts from the tabernacle and guides Israel away from Sinai out into the wilderness, and immediately things go terribly wrong. So in chapter 11, the people start complaining about their hunger and thirst and how they want to go back to Egypt. And then in chapter 12, Moses' own brother and sister begin opposing and bad-mouthing him in front of all of the people. This trip is not off to a good start. The next section begins as the Israelites arrive in the desert of Paran, about halfway to the Promised Land. And God tells Moses to send out the 12 spies, one for each tribe, so they can scout out the Promised Land. So when the spies all return, 10 of them say that there is no chance Israel can survive there because the Canaanites will destroy them. But there are two spies, Caleb and Joshua, who say that God can save them. But the ten whip up the people into a fearful rage, and they start planning a mutiny. They're going to appoint a new leader and head back to Egypt. So God is understandably angry, and Moses intercedes on the people's behalf. He calls God to be faithful to his promises to Abraham. And so God does, but not at the expense of his justice. He gives these Israelites what they want to not enter the land. And God sentences this generation to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they die. Only their children will get to enter the promised land. Now you'd think this severe consequence would wake them up, but it gets even worse. So in the next story, there's a whole group of Levites that begin a rebellion, and they challenge Moses and Aaron's leadership, saying that they have gone way too far. So God deals severely with these Levites, and he renews his commitment to Moses and Aaron as Israel's leaders. Now, as they leave the region of Paran and hit the road, it goes downhill yet again. The Israelites start complaining again about their thirst, and they ask why Moses even brought them out of Egypt in the first place. So God tells Moses to speak to a rock to bring out water for all of the people. But Moses doesn't really do this. He oversteps his bounds. He hits the rock twice and then says, you rebels, do we have to bring water out of this rock? So Moses dishonors God by putting himself in God's place as the one who brings out the water. And so Moses brings down on himself the same fate as the wilderness generation. He too will die in the desert and never get to enter the promised land. After this, the Israelites rebel yet again, and God brings a very strange judgment on them, venomous snakes to come and bite the people. And so Moses again intercedes on behalf of the people. And God tells Moses to do this, to make a bronze snake and to lift it up on a pole so that whoever looks at this snake would be healed of the poisonous snake bite. It's a very strange symbol, but it speaks to the challenge that God has by being faithful to his covenant. 
He's right to bring justice on the Israelites' evil and sin. But even God's justice gets transformed into a source of life for those who will look to God for healing. From here, the people head into the plains of Moab. And the first main part of the section focuses on the strange figure of Balaam. So the king of Moab is freaked out at this huge group of people traveling through his territory. So he hires a pagan sorcerer, Balaam, to pronounce curses on Israel. And three different times, Balaam finds that he cannot curse them. He can utter only blessing upon Israel. Remember God's promise to Abraham from Genesis 12. So not only can Balaam not curse Israel, but God actually gives him a vision about a future Israelite king who will one day bring God's justice to all of the nations. This vision recalls Jacob's promised Judah in Genesis chapter 49. Now it's worth stopping to reflect on the flow of the book so far. The rebellion stories in the wilderness, they just heap up on one another getting worse and worse. And while God does bring partial acts of judgment on Israel, he's also kept showing mercy, providing food and water along the way. And so the Balaam story, it shows God's grace in bright colors. Because here's Israel, they're down in the camp grumbling and rebelling, but up in the hills, unbeknownst to them, God is protecting and even blessing them. And it's this contrast between Israel's rebellion and God's faithfulness in the wilderness, that's what made these stories so important for later generations of Israel. So the wilderness stories are retold time and again by later biblical prophets, and poets, and even by the apostles in the New Testament. And these stories always serve as a warning that while God will remain faithful to his covenant promises, he will also allow his people to walk away in rebellion and face the consequences. After this, the rest of the book focuses on the children of the wilderness generation, and they begin preparing to inherit the promised land. They take another census of the new generation, then they go on and win a number of battles with the people groups around them, and then a few tribes even begin to settle in the promised land. So the book ends with the new generation poised to enter into the land, and Moses is about to deliver his final words of wisdom and warning. But for now, that's what the book of Numbers is all about. All right, you can go home now. <laughs> is that what you said? Well, actually, let's, uh, let's look at our handouts instead, Brother Peter. Is it, did everybody get a handout? Did everybody get the book of Numbers? I think we need to repeat some of these things. They say repetition is the mother of all learning. Now, the book of Numbers was not originally called Numbers in the Hebrew Bible. It was called Bemidbar, which is found in verse number one. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt. Um, that word Actually, no, it's not found in verse number one. I thought it was, was, but it's not. The word wanderings, bemidbar, means wanderings. Or no, it is. Sorry, it doesn't mean wanderings. It, <laughs> it is found in verse one. It means wilderness. Sorry, in wilderness. So in the, uh, it says, uh, in the wilderness of Sinai, in the be bemidbar. And that's really what it's all about. They're in the wilderness for 40 years. But while they're in the wilderness two things happen, and you see the word numbers, the, with the number of their names in verse three, two, sorry, verse two, and in verse three, you see the word number. And when the Bible was translated into Greek, the, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek in the 300 years before Jesus came, he was, quote, from the Septuagint, which was the Old Testament translated into Greek. And when they made the Septuagint, when they translated it, they used the Greek word that is found in verse 2, arithmoi. Arithmoi, where we get the word arithmetic. And uh, that's where we get that word. But it's because they numbered the children of Israel, and they did it twice. They numbered it at the beginning of the book, and then 40 years later, they took the number of who was left at the end of the book. And that was a huge change after 40 years. What what if you took a stock, if you took an arithmoy of, of your life, and, and if you took stock of, of your life at the beginning of 40 years and at the end of 40 years, 
Remember, Moses' life was broken up into three 40-year sections. He was in Egypt as a prince of Egypt for the first 40 years of his life. Then he tried to kill an Egyptian and ran away. And he was on the backside of the desert in the wilderness, wandering around for 40 years himself as a shepherd. But then God called him at age 80 to go to Pharaoh and say, Let my people go. And he began his ministry at age 80. So here he is at age 82, and, and he's about to start another 40 years of his life leading these people for 40 years in the wilderness. And uh, at the end, he's going to be 120 years old, and, and he's going to take this, this second numbering of the people. But that's a convicting thought, isn't it? Uh, what will your life look like in, if, God, if the Lord tarries in 40 years' time? Uh, Natalie's just saying she'll be 40 next year. So it's a good, <laughs> I'll, and then I'll be a 40 a, a little while later than that. But, but, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, it's a good time to take stock, isn't it? Um, but we should always be doing that and thinking. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, this is a very thoughtful book, especially as it, uh, it's resuming the, the, the narrative where Exodus left off. So that's the, the, the the, the name of the book, the, the author of the book, of course, is Moses. The Bible says in uh, Numbers 33, verses 1 and 2, let's read those verses together, uh, and then we'll come back to that. It says, These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt, with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out, according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. So it says Moses wrote their journeys. And this is the book that he wrote. The record of their wanderings. And over 80 times this book of Numbers says it was written by Moses. It actually says that. And so there's many people who say, no, no, no. It prophesies things that are going to happen in the future. So it must have been written afterwards by somebody else. But that's because they don't believe God can do miraculous things Moses wrote this book uh, under the inspiration of God the Bible says holy men uh, the book of P- Peter says holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost Who, when did he write it um, he wrote it it says this book begins the second month of the second year what was the first verse of Leviticus the first month of the second year so again we told you Leviticus only covered one month And here we go. Here's what happens after Leviticus uh, in the second month in 1451 uh, B.C. Uh, But what's the theme? The theme of this book is the goodness and severity of God. The goodness and the severity of God. In the video we watched, it just showed the failings of the Israelites and the faithfulness of God. The failings were met with severity, but God's faithfulness at the same time gave them his goodness. And the background. Even as they were murmuring and complaining down in the plain, in the wilderness, God was up on the mountain forcing Balaam. He was trying to curse them. He was getting paid by that wicked king, Balak, to curse Israel, but he couldn't get it. Blessings were coming out of his mouth instead. And God was looking out for Israel. God was being faithful to Israel. So, where do we get this phrase, the goodness and the severity of God? Well, Romans uses Israel as an example for us. It says, Israel, they turned away from God. They failed, yes. But, but uh, God's still going to turn back to them. And then it says, and if God punished his own nation of Israel, who he picked out of all the nations, not because they were great, but because he wanted to put his goodness on them, He picked them to bring the Bible into the world. He picked them to bring the Messiah into the world. And if he would punish them, that's a warning for us, Gentiles, that we shouldn't mess with God either. And so that's that's what Romans 11 is all about. And let's look at that passage, Romans 11. Uh, uh, I believe we have this one on the screen, Romans 11, um, verse 13 says, For I spake to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, 
I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. He's saying, I, I'm, hope, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, but I really hope that my people, the Jews, will turn back to God. But for now, he's letting you all hear the gospel, he says. He says, for if the casting away of, of, the, of them, of Israel, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? but life from the dead. He says God's going to be faithful to Israel. God's going to bring them back from the dead. And of course, we've seen that. Israel's a nation again, aren't they? Since 1948. It says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, Israel in other words, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, grafted back in. God will bring the Israel back in. For God is able to graft them in again. Again. And so uh, he says here, don't, don't be proud of yourself that you have faith um, and, don't, and think that you're not, you can't fall as well. You can fall. So here, this is the story of two generations. The old generation who, who didn't have faith and a new generation who did have faith. That we were praying earlier for the younger generation. But here in this story, we have it's the younger generation that did have faith, and it was the older generation that didn't have faith. And, uh, and, but God is able to raise them up. But, he, but then he says, but, but make sure you learn that lesson, that if you stand, it's by faith. And now he's speaking to this bigger picture. The Gentiles have come in. We're sort of the, the new generation. And he says, don't you dare condemn the old generation because if you if you, the same thing can happen to you take heed take heed he says so back to our uh, theme slide what is the theme of the book again the goodness and severity of God N- number one severity to the old generation and then number two goodness to the new generation Severity. Why was he severe with the old generation? It says because it says why in Numbers chapter thirteen and fourteen. Turn turn with me to there in your Bible, uh, and and Numbers thirteen and fourteen says first of all, the old generation got finally to Kadesh Barnea, and they're about to go into the land, and God sent twelve spies into the land. And you may have uh, heard the song before about the the 12 spies. I don't know, maybe you have. Uh, 12 men went to spy on Canaan. 10 were bad and 2 were good. What did they see when they spied on Canaan? 10 were bad and 2 were good. Some saw giants big and tall. Some saw grapes in clusters fall. Some saw God was in it all. 10 were bad and 2 were good. So there's 12 spies, one for each tribe, went into the land and uh, lists them there in chapter 13. But then it says that they returned. And if you have your Bible open to chapter 13, verse um, 26, it's not on the screen, but you can see it there in your Bible. It says, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. These giant grapes of Eskel. It took the two men on the, with a stick to carry one bunch of grapes. Could you imagine getting that from Tesco? Uh, 
Uh, one pastor named, um, uh, I can't remember his first name. I think it's Warren Hatch or something. No. Uh, I, but anyways, I can't remember his name, but he used to, I remember as a kid, uh, he was preaching about this, and he said that uh, if they didn't want to get their hair wet crossing back over the Jordan River, they could have just used one of the grapes as a, as a swimming cap and, and uh, gone back across. But, you know, this was uh, uh, amazing. All the fruit, they showed the fruit of the land, and they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless... The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. That means the giants. There were some children of Anak that were very tall, and they, they were like giants. And the Amalekites dwell in the land in the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And then verse 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. And there we saw the giants and the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in their own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the two good spies, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Isn't that sad? They're only a stone's throw away from their inheritance, but instead they're throwing stones at the two that have faith. And uh, it says in verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? So that is, uh, that's where we are. This old generation, they're not going to be able to go in. And it tells us why not in uh, the, the next verses in Numbers uh, 14, verse 29. Look at, look at verse 29. Let's skip ahead to there. God gives them this punishment, this severe punishment. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. They said, the land's going to eat us up. But no, God said, no, your unbelief is going to eat you up. The carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and all that were numbered of you, according to the whole number, every single one of them above 20 years old, all that were numbered. The ones under 20 were not numbered. And they're going to get to go into the land. Except for a couple. Let's read that. It says, according to your whole number, 20 years old and upward, which ye have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. That was his 
father's name, none. So my dad used to say, who's the only person in the Bible without a father? Joshua, because he was the son of none. But no, that was his father's name. But, but it says, but your little ones, which ye have said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. And if the, if I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness, they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. So why? Why is this? Is it God just being me? No, it's because of their unbelief. Verse 11 tells us that. Verse 11 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? So why did they not get to go in? Because they didn't believe. They didn't believe God. God had given them so many opportunities, but disbelief brings destruction. Unbelief brings destruction to the unbelievers. It doesn't hurt Anyone else but yourself. Unbelief brings destruction to the unbelievers. Uh, but but that's the severity. But God's goodness we see as well. Because in spite of that, he's going to be faithful to his promise. He's going to let them go in to the land. And he says this is going to be a time of uh, pre preparation. It's also, we learned last Sunday night, or two Sunday nights ago, it's a time of long suffering. He's giving the people of the Canaanites another 40 years to repent. Because when they do finally get into the land, Rahab said, we've been shaking in our boots ever since you crossed the Red Sea. <laughs> you know, Caleb and Joshua were right. They could have gone in and just taken it at the time, but they didn't believe. They said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight, but Joshua said, no, they're like grasshoppers in God's sight. And the, their, their difficulty got between them and God, where you should let God get between you and your difficulty. And he, he would have given them the victory there. But then the second, uh, the second point of the theme is the, the goodness of God to the new generation. And God, in, the, in the spite of all that, he gave them his protection. He gave them his provision. He provided them with his presence. He provided them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to guide them and to protect them. He provided them with manna in the wilderness to eat. And some people, they say two million people in the desert. And I, they, they say, that's impossible. That's a made-up fairy tale. What would they have eaten? Well, that's right. They would have died if it wasn't for God's providence. God provided for them manna and quail to eat. And God provided for them shoes that didn't wear out miraculously. That's another miracle that happened during those 40 years in the wilderness. Shoes that didn't wear out. The psalmist tells us about that miracle. And um, this new generation that God protected for the future, God provided for them for the future, uh, they were a generation not of disbelief, but they were a generation of faith. And the generation of faith is what is needed for the blessing of God. So the blessing of God finally did come on them. So then the outline. The outline uh, is given to you there on the screen and on your notes. We've got three sections. And I think that you'll remember this outline. If you, if you ever read the book, it'll, you'll see that this, is, this really is the outline of the book. Before we look at the outline, though, Let's look at the hinge, the hinge. What's the hinge of the book? It's when they got to Kadesh Barnea. And here's a picture of Kadesh Barnea in so the south, south of uh, the, the country, just at the southern border in the wilderness. And this is where Moses hit the, uh, he spoke, yeah, he hit the rock and out came water. 
They, they had no water, and there's still water there to this day. It's a bit of an oasis. And so that's, that's where they camped out at Kadesh Barnea. And it was from there that the 12 spies were sent out, and they came back, and they all wept to there. And get, so they left there, and then they, after 40 years, they came back there. And then Joshua sent um, the spies out again. So, uh, so this is the hinge point. Let's look at the outline again, Brother Sylvia. And uh, so we've got three sections. The old generation, chapters 1 to 14. The new generation, chapters 15, sorry, the transition era, chapters 15 to 20. And the new generation, chapters 21 to 36. But what's not on your outline on your piece of paper, which you might want to write down, is the places the places. So chapters 1 to 14 covers when from leaving Mount Sinai and going to Kadesh. That's the journey that they took. And then the second section is all in the wilderness. And it's not doesn't tell us everything that happened in 40 years. In fact, it tells us very little that happened in those 40 years. But it tells us a few highlights of things that happened, but mostly it's just a blank. And, uh, you know, sometimes our life can feel like that, just a, a wasted blank for sections of our life. But then uh, then the, the, the story picks up again uh, when they get back to Kadesh. And then they move from Kadesh to Moab and fight some battles and get ready to cross the Jordan River and number the people again. So, so that's uh, the, the places that, where it's happening. And that's the, the, um, the outline. So first of all, you've got uh, the numbering of the people. And the number, numbering of the people uh, is given in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it tells you how many are in each tribe. And by the way, in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, you'll notice that there are 12 tribes. And then, there's a, then in chapter 4, it starts talking about the the tribe of Levi as a 13th tribe. Why is that? Because Joseph's tribe was split into two, Ephraim and Manasseh, his two sons. And so there was 12 tribes, and then there was a separate tribe that, that they camped around the, uh, the tabernacle, the Levites did. And then there were three on each side surrounding. Imagine these two to three million people all organized, and God tells them exactly how to lay out their camp in these chapters, all very organized. And uh, God's trying, why does he do that? He says, by the number of your armies. He's saying, number your troops, number your troops so you can get up and fight. And you know, make sure you put a banner for each of your tribes out so that you can be inspired. And God's giving them all of the organization that they need. You know, God's given us all the organization we need in the New Testament for the church. He's told us exactly how to order the church and how to do things. But yet, that doesn't mean that we'll actually do it by faith, does it? We might fail to have faith as well. But God tells them, he says, I want you to be numbered so you can fight by your numbers. Uh, but then in chapter 5 to 9, he gives them the instruction. So he gives them the numbering, then the instructing. He instructs them of a, a number of different things how to keep holy, how to, if the, anybody wants to go the extra mile and make a Nazarite vow, uh, how to do that, um, how to keep things pure in the camp, how, to, uh, how the priests are supposed to do certain things. Um, and then he gives them the journeying, journeying from Sinai to, uh, to Kadesh, chapters 10 to 14. And that's when uh, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night lifts up from the tabernacle and they pack everything up and they start journeying. They start walking and following him. And the silver trumpets sound and they start to, to walk. And uh, Moses had, uh, uh, had said, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. In chapter 10. And he says, you know where we're supposed to go. Don't let us go anywhere without you. And we should say the same thing. Don't let us go anywhere without God's leading and guiding. 
and they didn't know where they were going to end up each day. They didn't know when the cloud was going to move. They didn't know when it was going to stop, and they didn't know where it was going to stop. They were just following God, and we don't know what tomorrow's going to hold, but we can follow God one day at a time on our pilgrim journey. And Numbers is a great book. There's a symbol of our journey towards heaven, a pilgrim journey. God will provide for us. And then uh, after three days of journeying, they start complaining. Uh, are we there yet? You know, I wish we could go back to Egypt, you know, and uh, it just took them three days to start complaining. And it was murmuring, a place called Tabera. And they said, we wish we had the, uh, by the way, it was the mixed multitude. The mixed multitude were the people who were mixed. Uh, they weren't all Israelite. There were some Egyptians that came with them. And they weren't allowed to fight. They were not allowed to be part of the numbers. And, you know, that's a symbol for us, too. If you're in a church and you're not a Christian, then you need to become a, you need to become a believer before you can take part, before you can, can take part in ministry. But the mixed multitude, they were the one. And there's a lot of churches that have a lot of mixed multitudes, aren't, don't they? Uh, they have people who are not believers mixed in with the believers. And it's good that they come and they hear the gospel, but sometimes they, they, they make them, a, uh, they say, it's not important that you trust Christ as your Savior. It's not important that you're born again first. You can, you, can, uh, you can take part in whatever. But the most important thing is that we believe and we're baptized and then we can start to take part and be involved in the church. But these mixed multitude, they were getting involved and they were putting their two cents worth in and they were the ones who said, we need to go back to Egypt. We had leeks, we had onions, we had all these other things. That's what we want. And they're the ones who stirred up the people. And that, but uh, they murmured and God gave them this miracle bread from heaven, manna. Psalm chapter uh, 78 calls it angel's food. Angel's food. It says uh, this manna that God gave them. And uh, then, of course, God gave them all sorts of other things. They, they murmured, by the way, eight times. Four times on their way to Kadesh. They murmured about the way that God led them. This is a difficult road. They murmured about the food he fed them with. God gave them manna, and then they complained about that and said, this is just boring, the same thing every day. And then they complained against the leader that God had set over them. And Korah and his men said, we, we, we could do a better job than you, Moses. And so God opened up the ground and swallowed up Korah and his men. And then they, they complained against the land that he had promised that he was going to give them. And so four times on their way to Kadesh, and then after Kadesh, four more times, they murmured against God's verdict that he said, you're going to wander for 40 years. And then they said, no, no, okay, we'll go up now. And they tried to go up, and they, God, Moses said, no, God's not with you. He said, you're going to wander for 40 years. You have to take your consequences. And they said, no, no, we're going. And they died. They, they, they got killed. And uh, they murmured against God's righteous verdict. They murmured against his appointments. They murmured against the thirst. And so God gave them water. And they murmured against God's provision of the, the quail. And, uh, but most of the time, it tells us a few times they murmured, but most of the time is a blank of the 40 years. And then finally, the, the 40 years is over. And it tells us the new journeying. They journeyed back to Kadesh. And then they had a new numbering, first chapters 26 and 27, and they numbered the ones who had been 20 and younger, and now they're the new generation. They numbered them now. And all the others were dead. And then they had the new instructing. God gives them new instructions. And then let's look at the, uh, the key word of the book is the word sojourn. Sojourn. The key verse is chapter 33, verse 1. It says, these are the journeys of the children of Israel. We read that earlier, but the key word is sojourn, which means a temporary stay. God says you're going to sojourn in the wilderness. It's not going to be forever. God never intended the wilderness to be permanent. It's just a temporary stay. Special features of the book. Uh, number one, the book gets its name from the two numberings of the men 20 years old and, uh, and, and older, able to go to war. The first numbering 
chapter 1, verse 46, at Mount Sinai, there were 603,550, but 603,547 of them died. And then after 40 years, the second numbering, chapter 26, verse 51, which happens in the plains of Moab, the ones who had been 20 and younger, there's now 601,730 of them, including Caleb and Joshua, who get to go in with them and lead them in. By the way, uh, when we get to the book of Joshua, we're going to see that a lot of those people, they, they weren't really f training to fight battles, except for Caleb's family. He was one that took all the land that God told him to take. And I think the whole time that we were wandering in the wilderness, Caleb was saying, we can do this. And he was training his family, saying, we can take this land. And he was training them how to fight. He was training them, keeping them up, for keeping their faith up. And so I, I, I think that's a nice little, uh, you can imagine what was going on during those 40 years. The whole army filled with fear died, and the new army filled with faith would go in. Second special feature is that Israel wandered one year for every day the spies were in the land living in unbelief, which is 40. And the special feature number three, the trip from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea is only 11 days, but it took them 40 years. How do we know it's supposed to be an 11-day journey? Because it tells us in the very next book, Deuteronomy 1 verse 2, it says there are 11 days journey from Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, by the way of Mount Seir, unto Kadesh Barnea. But instead, it took them 40 years. And as we said before, it took them 40 hours to get out of Egypt, but it took them 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And then finally, let's look at this, as we do every, every week, Christ in the book of Numbers. We see... Uh, a picture of Christ in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We read about that in Numbers chapter 9, verses 51 to 23. We won't read it for now, but we think about God's abiding presence was with them all the time. And he also guided them with his presence. Hebrews 13, 5 says that he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. They shouldn't have feared. They should have known. He's with us. Jesus is with us. And we should not fear. We should not fear. We should have faith by his presence with us. And by the way, in uh, the book of Psalms, it not only tells us that God gave them angels food, but it says he led them by his angel through the wilderness. So some people put those two things together and say, maybe that the, that the, that the pillar of fire was the presence of Jesus, the angel of the Lord himself. He was leading them. The second uh, uh, picture of Christ in the book is the brazen serpent. Do you remember that story about how when they, uh, they, one of the last times they rebelled against the Lord and wanted to, um, uh, wanted to fight against him was that uh, when God uh, said, I'm going to destroy them all, and he sent these fiery serpents into the camp, and Moses prayed for them. And so he said, he prayed for them a lot in this book. <laughs> and he said, please, your faithfulness, don't destroy them. And he said, this is what they should do for their, uh, for their, uh, healing. Make a brazen serpent and put it on a pole. What is the symbol on the side of ambulances for, uh, for healing? Represents healing. A, a brazen serpent. What's that symbol on the Red Cross? Uh, well, there's the cross, but a lot of the times they would use that brazen serpent. And that is a symbol of healing. Why? Because it, it all, what do they have to do? It says, whoever looks will live. That's all they had to do, look and live. And what do you have to do to be saved? Do you have to do a bunch of amazing things to try to impress God? No. You look to Jesus in faith and you live. So this brazen serpent, how is it a picture of Christ? 
God told him to do it. It was appointed by God. The cross, as well as God's divinely appointed means of salvation. It was made of brass, and brass in the Bible is a picture of judgment. The brazen altar took the fire in the tabernacle on the, on the animal. A picture of God's judgment. And this brazen serpent, God, Jesus took our judgment on the cross. He was lifted up on a pole, wasn't he? On a tree, on a, on a cross. And uh, it was the only divinely appointed remedy. There, G, Moses did, wasn't told to do anything else. If you want to live, you have to look at this brazen serpent. And Jesus, he's the, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Look to Jesus and live. There's no other person that can give you eternal life. And uh, it was something that would last. Now, by the way, years later, one of the kings found that the people were worshiping this brazen serpent. Hezekiah's day. And uh, so he destroyed it. But you know what? Sometimes people, they worship the symbol of the cross instead of worshiping Jesus himself. A, a picture of Jesus, a, a brazen metal picture of Jesus on a cross. And they don't have actual faith in him. You know, Don't turn the cross into an idol. Put your faith in Christ. Look to him. And then uh, it was something that anybody could see. That he was lifted high in the center of the camp, this brazen serpent, and Jesus was lifted high. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. It was available for anyone who was bitten. And Jesus is available for anyone who's ever sinned, which includes all of us. And it was available for Anybody, no matter how serious of a disease they uh, snake bite the head, and no matter how serious your sin is, Jesus can help you. This was available however many times a man was bitten, they could look again to, to this brazen serpent. And no matter how many times you've sinned, you can look. There's no limits to how many sins Jesus can forgive. Anyone, no matter young, old, uh, whether they were a slave or a priest or anybody, it was, and Jesus' death is for all people. And uh, there's not a single person who, if they looked, that they didn't live. And there's not a single person, if they look to Christ, will not have eternal life, if they look to him in faith. And uh, it's so easy, isn't it? Look, looking is easy, but salvation, it all involves is a look of faith. It's, some, it's so simple, many people stumble right over it. Maybe somebody was in a tent and they said, they said there's, a, there's an answer. You just have to look outside the tent and look at the brazen serpent and you'll live. And they probably said, no, that's, that's too good to be true. I'm not even going to try that. That's too simple. It must have to be just something to do more complicated than that. That's insulting my intelligence, you know. But, uh, but they might not have done it. But they, if they didn't, it was to their own hurt. And each person had to do it for themselves. And if they did, instantly they would be healed. And the same is true for salvation. The moment you place your faith in Christ, that moment you receive eternal life and forgiveness of your sins. So look to him. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 14, Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And the next verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We all know John 3.16, I think. We've probably all heard it before. The most famous verse in the Bible. But did you know that it's talking about the brazen serpent? And it's saying that Jesus is the same. So it's the ultimate picture of Christ in the book. But there's one more. Uh, the cities of refuge. The cities are actually there's there's one more besides that that's not on your notes, but I think that rock, that rock that Moses hit, and water came out. Jesus was struck on the cross and he brought blessings. Come now, found of every blessings we sang earlier. Amen. But then Moses came back to that rock, and he was told this time speak to the rock. But he didn't. He struck it. Second time, which messed up the type, messed up the symbol, because Jesus only had to be struck once, and he could give blessings forever. 
But Moses struck it twice, and so God said, sorry, that's that you can't go into the promised land either. <clears throat> but then finally, the cities of refuge, there's this, in Numbers chapter 35, there's a place of safety from the judgment. If somebody's after you to kill you, you could run to these six cities of refuge that they were going to build, and as long as the high priest was alive, you could be safe in the cities of refuge. And as long as Jesus is alive, if you come to him, he's our city of refuge. And that's what we're going to sing about as we finish out tonight. The hiding in thee. He is our hiding place. And I hope you come to Christ today. Let's sing Hiding in Thee. It's page number 348 if you need the book. Let's stand together. safe to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflict and sorrows would fly, so sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be, thou blessed rock of you've learned something tonight and I hope you're glad you stayed brother Peter <laughs> let's uh, just to give you a few notices uh, this Friday is the ladies Bible study and uh, and the new uh, Calvary Baptist Church School of the Bible at 10 a.m. but it's uh, also well, afterwards instead of letter boxes we're going to be making pack lunches for the 36 people that will be going on God willing, on uh, Saturday. But then this Friday night is our Ladies Monthly Fellowship. So Ladies Fellowship is this Friday at uh, 6 p.m. here at the church building. And uh, please see Natalie if you uh, are coming, or you can sign up there on our calendar on the website. Uh, then on, uh, s on Saturday is this Sunday School Day in uh, Gloucester. And uh, if you're coming, we need to be leaving the church building about 8 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, so please do 
It's uh, not. It's a bit earlier even than school, but the kids can sleep on the minibus. You can tell them that. You can sleep on the minibus. All right, and then, uh, but also Saturday, if you're not coming to Gloucester, is the monthly men's breakfast in Bourne. Bourne Evangelical Church, PE 10 9LB is the postcode. And let me know if you're coming so I can tell Brother Jason how many sausages to make. And then... Uh, don't forget on Sunday we have the at uh, Newborough in the morning Sunday school here in the afternoon and he, back here in the evening uh, at night and then don't forget there's also other things you can sign up for uh, like the camping trip in the month of June and uh, and by the way um, brother Tim has sent out an email to everybody that we have e- your email for about things you can help with uh, and so there's a uh, there's this slide that we put up on the screen, uh, volunteers needed. But he sent out a fun email. I preached about laborers, uh, pray that there would be laborers in God's harvest on Sunday morning. So he had this idea to send everybody something that you can say, I think I want to know more about helping in this ministry or that ministry. So just uh, you can fill out that fun form, uh, and uh, it, would, it would be great to have more laborers involved. So let's just close in a word of prayer. Brother Steve, would you mind standing and leading us all in our closing prayer? Good Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this uh, wonderful time we've had together. Father, we thank you for Pastor Jonathan's uh, clear explanation of, of the book of Numbers. Father, how interesting it was, Father, that showed your dealings with your people, Lord their wanderings, Lord. We thank you that you are faithful, even if we sometimes are unfaithful. Father, we thank you that you're able to restore us and bring us back to yourself. Lord, we thank you for your great promise that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, Lord. My all believe and be saved. Look unto Jesus. He is our refuge, our strength, our salvation. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you all. God bless you.